Integration at the A levels. You probably already know how to do differentiation of some basic functions. You also probably know that integration is simply the reverse of differentiation. If we want to differentiate the function x cubed, we need to bring the 3 down and reduce the power by 1 to obtain 3x squared. Likewise, when we integrate 3x squared, we'll obtain x cubed. Dividing by 3 on both equations, we have the integral of x squared equals to x cubed over 3. And strictly speaking, this is also true when we add any arbitrary constant c. This is known as the arbitrary constant of integration. So we want to answer two questions. How to integrate and why should we integrate? Perhaps it makes more sense to wonder why we should integrate first. There are applications in geometry and in science. And the first geometric application is in calculating areas under curves. When considering the function y equals to f of x, we might be interested in calculating the area under the curve. If we nudge the right hand line a little bit to the right, we'll obtain the red increment in area, which is approximately equal to a rectangle with base delta x and height f of x. As we let this increment get smaller and smaller, we're going to approximate the function value f of x. But the right hand side is nothing more than the definition of the derivative of a with respect to x. So integrating on both sides, the area is given by an integral. If we denote the left and right hand limits by a and b respectively, the area is strictly speaking the integral from a to b, which we can calculate by integrating f and plugging in these end limits. In this example, we are using the function y equals to x squared and the area we are calculating is from 0 to 1. We've integrated x squared to get x cubed over 3 just now. We can plug in the limits and obtain an area of 1 over 3. We can even use this idea to calculate several infinite series. Before taking n to infinity, we can rewrite this expression as 1 over n times a sum. This can be rewritten into a sum of base times height, where the base refers to the base of one rectangle, and the height refers to the height of that corresponding rectangle. In other words, the quantity that we were interested in is a sum of areas of rectangles. But as we increase the number of rectangles, the sum of the area of the rectangles approaches the area under the curve. But we know how to find the area under the curve of y equals to x squared. It's the integral from 0 to 1. And we've calculated this to be equal to 1 over 3 just now. Using this idea, can you find the limit of this particular sum? You might find this diagram and these rectangles helpful. Another interesting quantity is the volume of revolution, where we can take a bunch of cylinders and make them finer and finer and finer so that the result looks like a solid that is obtained by revolving the curve. What is the volume of this final object? Well, since each cylinder has radius y and height delta x, letting n go to infinity, the sum becomes an integral and the delta x becomes a dx. Finally, to be precise, we integrate from a to b to obtain the volume of revolution. In the animation, we are integrating from 0 to 1 and we're using the same function y equals to x squared. Using algebra to simplify, we integrate x to the 4th to get x to the 5th over 5. We plug in the limits and obtain a volume of 1 over 5 pi. Similarly, can you find the volume of revolution of y equals to x times e to the negative x over 2? A crucial scientific application of integration is in the study of kinematics. The rate of change of displacement is the velocity, and the rate of change of the velocity is acceleration. Integrating on both sides, the displacement is the integral of the velocity, and the velocity is the integral of the acceleration. Furthermore, if acceleration is a constant, then we're going to get the constant v0 plus a times t. We can plug that into the displacement equation and integrate that to obtain the constant s0 plus v0 times t 
plus half a t squared, which is obtained by integrating t. These give rise to the famous kinematics equations in physics. But a similar equation in kinematics arises when considering the motion of falling objects. We want to try to find the velocity v. To do this, we can divide out the v terms onto one side, integrate with respect to t. On the left side, we get an integral with respect to v. And on the right side, we get an integral with respect to t. Will you be able to calculate v? More generally, we can separate out the y's from the x's and integrate both sides separately. This is known as the method of separable variables. And using this same technique, we can obtain the formula that governs first order rates of reactions. These are the problems that we can solve using integration. But how do we actually go about using integration to make these calculations? If one of the key formulae in differentiation is the chain rule, which helps us differentiate the composite function one layer at a time, then one of the most important tasks is to reverse the chain rule. We integrate on both sides, and the left side is the composite function, while the right side is a rather complicated integral. This is actually the most important formula in integration, and we can best understand it through several examples. We have previously learned that the integral of 1 over x is the logarithm. So if we now modify the left-hand integral, by the reverse chain rule, the right side is going to be a logarithm as well. But this time, we include the f of x inside. We previously actually asked how to find v given this equation. The right-hand side is easy enough to integrate. It is just t plus a constant. On the left side, we're going to do a little bit of algebra because the numerator is the derivative of the denominator. Integrating that will give us the logarithm. Simplifying with a little bit of algebra, we can obtain the expression for v. Some useful integral formulas include the integral of 1 over x as well as the integral of 1 over x squared plus k squared. This helps us calculate the integral of a linear function over a quadratic function. The strategy is to break down the 2x plus 3 into the first term, which involves the derivative of the denominator, and a second constant term. Without actually knowing what a and b is, we can first plug it into the integral, split it up using some integral properties, and since the first expression corresponds to the integral of 1 over x, the first term will integrate to a logarithm term. On the other hand, the second term can be simplified by completing the square. And here, 1 is the derivative of x plus 1. Since this expression is essentially the integral of 1 over x squared plus k squared, including the derivative in order to reverse the chain rule, we can simplify that to get the inverse tangent expression. Finally, in order to complete our integration, we need to include the constant of integration, and in fact, we still need to solve for a and b. So let's simplify the derivative of x squared plus 2x plus 5 to get 2x plus 2. We can compare the coefficients and obtain our final answer for the integral. This is how we can use partial fractions in order to calculate integrals of rational functions. There are many interesting trigonometric integrals that we can calculate as well. For example, we want to find the integral of sine squared times cosine squared. While it's not as straightforward as other integrals, we can simplify this using double angle formulae. Plugging the expression into the integral, we can integrate the constant to get 1 over 8 times x. And for the cosine term, there's a 4x inside. So we need to ensure that the derivative of 4x is present before we can do the integration. Since we are essentially integrating cosine, and since the derivative of 4x is present, we can apply the reverse chain rule to get 1 over 32 sine of 4x, which is the final answer to our integral. Sometimes we are asked to find a similar integral, except now one of the terms has an odd power. We can extract out the extra sine term, convert the remaining sine terms into cosine terms, and simplify. We can plug this expression now into the integral, split up the integral, and rewrite each term as follows. Now we have cosine 
and the derivative of cosine, which is the negative of sine. In both cases, we're integrating a power with the derivative of cosine present for reverse chain rule, and we can easily integrate both expressions to get our final answer. But sometimes we need to integrate sine times cosine where the expression inside each trigonometric function is different. The trick is to consider the addition formulae for trigonometric functions. We can divide by 2 on both sides. We can solve for p and q to be 8x and 2x respectively. And since the right hand side is sine of 5x times cosine of 3x, we can plug the left hand side into the integral. Just like before, we need to include the derivatives in order to apply the reverse chain rule. And since the integral of sine is negative of cosine, it's not too difficult to do the integration. Thus, we get a combination of cosine terms as our final answer. Earlier on, I raised the question of how to calculate this infinite sum. As we've seen, it's the limit of a bunch of rectangles, which gives us the area under the curve from 0 to 1. But since the derivative of negative of x squared is negative of 2x, we need to do a bit of manipulation to extract out the derivative of negative of x squared. With the derivative present, we are now integrating the exponential. The integral of the exponential is just the exponential. Plugging in the limits, we can simplify our answer to get this final expression for the limit of the sum. If we know how to reverse the chain rule, can we try to reverse the product rule? We can start with the basic product rule in differentiation. Integrate on both sides. On the left side, the integral and the derivative cancels out. On the right side, we can split up the integral and isolate the integral of v prime u. This is the famous integration by parts formula. And notice two things that happen. Firstly, the v prime gets integrated into v. Secondly, the u will remain the same and get differentiated. For that reason, we can abbreviate this using the acronym ISID, which tells us one function gets integrated while another function gets differentiated. So let's try to find the integral of x times e to the x. Let's suppose we integrate x and differentiate e to the x. Let's write out the ISID and integrate x to get x squared over 2. We can copy and paste the e to the x and differentiating e to the x, we actually just get e to the x. This actually makes our problem a lot worse than it should be, so let's not take this approach. Instead, let's integrate e to the x and differentiate x. Writing ISID, we integrate e to the x to get e to the x. We can copy and paste the x and differentiate the x to get 1. Simplifying, the integral of the exponential is just e to the x. We can plus c and that is our final answer. Why does this work you might ask? We chose the functions according to a heuristic known as liate. The function that's more rightward gets integrated while the other function gets differentiated. In this case, the rightmost function is e to the x which gets integrated and the other expression is an algebraic expression and gets differentiated. Putting this idea into practice, we can find the integral of x times cosine of x. Write down the ISID once again, and between cosine and x, cosine is more rightward. Therefore, cosine gets integrated into sine of x. This leaves us with x remaining the same and getting differentiated to 1. Simplifying, the integral of sine is just negative of cosine. Simplifying, we get our final answer. We can even use this trick to obtain the integral of the logarithm of x. It might not be obvious what the two functions are, but a useful trick is to note that log equals to 1 times the log. Interpreting 1 as x to the 0, 1 is the more rightward function that gets integrated to x, while the logarithm remains the same and gets differentiated to 1 over x. Simplifying, the integral of 1 is just x, adding the arbitrary constant and that is our final answer. We can repeat this idea for the inverse tangent of x. We write the inverse tangent as 1 times the inverse tangent, and since 1 is more rightmost, we will integrate that into x.
we'll keep the tangent inverse and differentiate it to get 1 over 1 plus x squared. We'll manipulate the second term to make sure that the numerator is the derivative of the denominator. Integrating that gives us the logarithm of 1 plus x squared. That is our final integral. Sometimes we need to do integration by parts multiple times. Consider the integral of the exponential times the cosine. Since the exponential is rightmost, we'll integrate that to get e to the x, keeping the cosine and differentiate it to get negative of sine. Simplifying, we get the integral of the exponential times sine. So once again, we'll choose the exponential to get integrated into the exponential. Sine remains the same and gets differentiated into cosine of x. Simplifying, it seems like we got the same expression as before. So let's just replace that with i and do a bit of algebra to obtain our final answer. We can use this idea to calculate the volume that we wanted to calculate before. Substituting the expression and simplifying using algebra, we now need to find the integral of x squared times e to the negative x. Since the exponential is rightmost, we'll integrate that to get negative of e to the negative x. We'll keep the x squared and differentiate it to get 2x. Simplifying, we can do ISID a second time. And since the exponential is rightmost, we'll integrate negative of e to the negative x to get e to the negative x. We'll keep the x and differentiate that to get 1. Simplifying, the integral of the negative of e to the negative x is simply e to the negative x. Adding the constant, we get our final answer. So we can plug in the limits of integration to obtain the volume of revolution. This is A-level integration in a nutshell.